perfect example, if I may use Moses. If he didn't write down the description of where his collecting events occurred, and he just gave the coordinates after the fact, nothing says that it's not in Nigeria. And so, people will take the coordinates as face value and say, oh, this plant, endemic to Cameroon, occurs in Nigeria. I'm going to write a paper when it's not true. If he keeps the locality description, he can check that against the coordinates and find out, no, something's wrong with my coordinates. So having the description is a backup and a way to do the check. Then the recommendation is to keep decimal degrees and as I discussed earlier, to keep seven decimal places of precision for the reasons of being able to transform back and forth without losing information. And then, when you're taking the coordinates from the GPS, record them as they come from the GPS. Don't do an interpretation. It's just like keeping a verbatim locality. Write it down as you see it. You can do transformations to it later, but be faithful to what you saw. The reason for that is if you're writing it down and not downloading it, you have the possibility of getting a digit wrong. And if you get that digit wrong in the wrong place, it can make a huge difference. So better to keep it in the original as it appears and avoid any further possibilities of errors. Now, I wanted to give you an idea. I had talked earlier about the effects of not knowing the datum. That with a GPS, you might end up in one place when you should end up in the other because the GPF, GPS is using the wrong datum. This graphic is a map showing that the little pluses are all the locations in latitude and longitude for a single coordinate. It's 97 degrees. 44 minutes, 25.19, very precise, degrees west in longitude. And what you see is the points vary all over the place. Each one of these is a different datum. So coordinates alone do not describe a position on the Earth uniquely. That same coordinate is in all those places, depending on the datum. So if you want to describe a point on the surface of the Earth, you need not only the latitude and the longitude, but also the datum. And then with that, you can transform it to WGS84 so that when you plot it on Google Earth yourself, it's in the right place. If you don't, and there's a difference between the datums, when you plot it on Google Earth, you'll end off end up away from where it should be, systematically. And that's a very difficult thing to determine after the fact. I talked a little about GPS accuracy earlier. It's dependent on the number of satellites in your field of view, which is why if you're in a city, buildings are obscuring some of your, your uh, satellites. Also, interference. The GPS is reading signals from satellites. And what it really depends on is the distance between the satellite and the GPS itself. And it measures that in time. How long did it take the signal to get from the satellite to me? I use the speed of light and the time to determine my distance from the satellite. Well. If the signal has to go boom, 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 boom to get to me, then the satellite seems to be further away than it really is. And so the position of my GPS is potentially wrong. And then the, the good GPS will say, look, I'm getting some inconsistencies. I can't really be at all these places at the same time. So I am inaccurate to some amount, and that's what it's reporting to you. And that amount that it's reporting is theoretical based on how long it takes for those signals to get to you. 
And as I said earlier, you want to record the accuracy then because it's not available to you any time after. It's not in the GPS. The concept of extent, it is the size of an area within which something occurred, either a collecting event or an observation event. So it can be any different kind of feature. These are some examples of them, and there are many, many more. Remember that we want to pick extents, we want to pick features, named places, that have the smallest possible extent for our references when we created locality description. And then, just to be complete, we want to keep track of all of our references. Where did the information come from? So if we're using a map, we want enough information that someone else can use the same map. So we would give it the name. You remember at the top of the map that I showed you? There was a name for it. Somewhere at the bottom it says who published it and what year that was published. The scale, sheet number, everything to identify the exact map that you use so somebody else can use the same map. Alternatively, you might be using some kind of other map or a gazetteer and you want to make note of that. If you used an altimeter, say so. If you use a GPS, say so. And say what the datum and accuracy were when you used it. So, to contrast two examples of localities for bad and better. Example of a vague location. Here's one that says just the Sacramento River Delta. That's huge. It's a very big area. So what we really want to do is be more specific. So what we do is we say lock on the Sacramento River Delta in this county in California. That's constraining the part of the River Delta. Another one is three miles west of San Jose slash Cartago border. If you think about it, this is a border between two cantons. What are they called in Costa Rica? Departments? I don't remember. In any case, they're basically the, the equivalent of a district. So that we're talking about the border between two districts. That's like a river. It's a long thing, potentially. So without any additional details, this would mean anywhere within three miles west of the border. And that's quite big. Instead, it would be better to specify more specifically. So it's three miles west of the border, but on some highway in a province in Costa Rica. If it's on the highway, then I use the intersection between that highway and the border. It's a very specific spot. It's not the whole border as in the other case. Again, I'm keeping my extent small. Another good one is to use the names of roads without any additional reference. If I just say Highway 9 in this province, it's a very long distance. Instead, it's better to say the intersection of the Highway 9 with a river. This Rio Cariblanco is a river. In the town of Cariblanco, I'm being very specific, in this province in Costa Rica. Again, it's being specific and another one. All of them are the same things. Be more specific. Then we have some particular problems that arise. Localities that become difficult to georeference, for example, in this case. The truth of the matter is that there is a battle mountain that is a mountain, and there's a battle mountain that is a city in Lander County, Nevada. I don't know the difference between the two from this description. Could have been in the city or they could have been on the mountain. I have no way to know. If in the description it tells me that it's the city, then I do know and I don't have two alternate possibilities. Here, I have a difficulty because this is a kilometer post. And a kilometer post is great when I'm at the kilometer post. 
It's a very specific place on the highway. But if I'm not on the highway, all I have is a map. The kilometer post is not on the map. I can't find it again. I have to find somebody who knows, who drives that highway and says, oh yeah, you know, the kilometers start in such and such a city and they go that way increasing. That's what I would need in order to do the georeference. Well, wouldn't it be better to just say, fine, it's on kilometer 58, but it's also six kilometers south of the town of Cartago on that highway. Then I don't need to go looking for kilometer 58. And then this one. This actually we turned into a t-shirt. What it is, is a map with some descriptions, text descriptions of place. And on the back of the t-shirt were a whole set of other descriptions. These are ones that are just plain crazy. There are a few favorites. It's too small to see, but I'll point some out. The one here, this is basically a small squirrel in the ocean. The description was 19 kilometers west of Boonville. If you go from Boonville 19 kilometers west, you are in the Pacific Ocean. And it was for a squirrel. So it was the first documented occurrence of a pelagic chipmunk. <coughs> no, squirrels don't live in the ocean. Something was wrong with that one. Turns out, with further research, the description was fine except the 19 kilometers west was along a road and the road went like this through the mountains. And so when you end up at the end of 19 kilometers, you're still on land and not in the ocean. Another one is Bob Jones's yard. If you know Bob Jones, that's great. His yard is pretty small. If you don't know Bob Jones, forget it. You have no idea where it is. So over time, we did a bunch of georeferencing together and we kept a collection of all these strange things that happened. And the best thing of all was that after doing all of this georeferencing, the director of our museum, who should have known better, wrote down a classic locality of his own. He wrote, on beach, under rock, as a locality description. This is a director who does niche modeling. He did also take a, a GPS coordinate. However, the description itself had nothing to do with the coordinate and so you couldn't use it to check the coordinates. Okay, that's it for good and bad localities. <coughs>